Okay, we're going to start. The next session is on aquatic species, and the moderator for this session is Corey Schaefer with NOAA Fisheries. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Do you have the mic on correctly? Great. All right, well, I'm Corey Schaefer. I'm with NOAA Fisheries. I work in the Habitat Conservation Division. So I'm working on uh, protection, restoration of marine and estuarine habitat with an eye towards healthy populations of fish. So from my agency's perspective, we're thrilled to have the benthic invertebrate and the fish monitoring that we're, ha we're seeing with the South Bay Salt Ponds. I'm very excited to see some of the results today. We have three speakers, excellent speakers, and we're going to try to stay on time. We're a few minutes behind, but um, just five. We're doing pretty good. So let's get started with Jan Thompson, who's with USGS, and she's going to talk about benthic communities pre- and post-restoration. I would like to start by thanking Laura for inviting us and um, to acknowledge my co-author, who's running around with one of the mics, uh, Francis Barchazzo. Um, I'm not sure about this, uh, this audience, and uh, so I, I decided to, you know, the scope of the knowledge of this audience, when, I, when we talk about benthic community in this audience, I know that everyone will think about them as bird food, so I'm sure that we have that part right. Um, but I'd like to expand your horizons a little bit beyond that and talk about why it is we look at the benthic community. And um, to make the comment that we are about 60% into a two-year grant, so we'll be showing some preliminary results, but certainly not all of our results. Um, we look at the benthic community because it tends to integrate um, across a number of processes in the, in the ecosystem. And that's because it, it, members of the benthic community can consume the smallest, the beginning of the food web, the phytoplankton bacterial stage, and they can be consumed at the highest levels, including at the human level. So um, I'm going to start with a brief refresher on what the function of the benthic community and the ecosystem is, and then we'll move into some of our data. They play, this is the part that you all know. One of their major functions is their prey for birds, fish, and crustaceans in the system. And I'm showing two pictures here because I want people to think about the fact that it's not just what happens in the inner tidal. It's also what happens in the subtitle. And depending on the predator, the predators can structure the benthic community. And so we get major changes, as you'll see, in the community as a result of seasonal predation from birds in particular. <clears throat> they also are consumers of carbon in the system, and this is something that people sometimes forget. They are major consumers of phytoplankton, shown here with a Ah, shown here is a clam. They consume, they filter out the stuff from the water column. They can also vacuum up whatever hits, lands on the, on the uh, mud surface, and they can consume things that grow on the mud surface. They also consume things that are very, very different species, obviously, very deep in the sediment, and this is an important process. And then there are those that crawl around and build tubes near the surface of the sediment. A corollary, therefore, to that, um, one of their functions is as a consumer is that they also mix the sediment. They can bring anoxic sediment up to the surface. Unfortunately, they also can bring things up to the surface that are connected to that anoxic sediment, including contaminants. And they're an important uh, component in the, in the nutrient recycling because they, they bring in phytoplankton and their excretory products can be very, very high in nitrogen. So um, they're an important process in the nitrogen and um, nutrient cycling system. It's in all aquatic systems. That's not just in, in asteroids or in ours. Um, the third thing I'd like to bring up that's less frequently commented on is that they're also vectors for contaminants. Um, we've, over the decades, have used benthic animals to monitor contaminants in systems because they hang out in one spot, they can't move, and they're a very good integrator of what's happened over their lifetime and over the water column that's flowed back and forth over them over that time period. We need to take it to the next level and realize that whatever they're accumulating, they're now moving into the trophic trophic system, and we need to think about that also. 
Our, our main purpose in this study is to look at uh, if the benthic functions have changed pre and post restoration. We're doing that by examining data that we collected in the 1990s between 93 and 95. In 2006 and 2009, we've tried to match hydrologic year types here. But primarily, the difference is that one, one set of this data is before and one set is after. These are spatially intensive samples that were done three times a year at 50 some stations that we have then reduced to 28 stations that we're processing for this process for this this study they go from San Mateo Bridge to Coyote Creek we sample them in spring summer and fall and so we have data for the three years before and data for three plus years after to start this process even though our interest is in what how the function of the community is changing um, within this system, realizing this benthic community both can affect the function and it reflects the function of the ecosystem. If, this, if the ecosystem is changing, the dynamics and the species that you'll find in the benthic community will change, but they can also affect how the system changes and you'll, uh, how the system operates, and we'll talk about that. To do that, we need to start with who's there. And it's a basic problem with all benthic studies. We need somebody to identify them. We do the sorting in-house. We have a consultant do the taxonomy. Um, and then we take that species list and we come up with what their functional feeding group is. And their feeding group is important because it not only determines what of those levels that I just spoke about, do they get their, wa their food from the water column, from the sediment, deep in the sediment, tells us where they are in that structure, but it also tells us what their potential for loading for contaminants is. Are they primarily going to get it from a water column source? Are they going to get it from a sediment source? And then we also identify where they live in the sediment. And this will define what predators are capable of getting to them. Because if they're living a meter down in the sediment on a hard tube, there aren't very many predators that can get to them. This um, diagram gives you a very good uh, idea of some of the functional groups that we look at as far as feeding groups. We're, we're interested in dividing them up, and so we look at every species and identify which functional group they're in. This, uh, I'm going to run through those three functional groups and, and uh, give you an idea of what we find in the system and then some of our preliminary findings. We have primarily findings on the bivalves in the system because that's the part of the, the um, uh, samples that the USGS does in-house. The taxonomy is pretty straightforward, and we've been able, we've, we've essentially uh, finished that portion of the study. We're waiting for the rest of the community analysis. What is known um, about the benthosis prey is large, a large part is the, um, the bird diet that we know is um, uh, heavily dependent on the benthos for their, their survival. Uh, and the ducks are dependent on, used to be dependent on the bivalves, which we used to have large numbers that live uh, three to four years and uh, get to be one to two centimeters long. And that's shown here. However, if you look at the bottom of, the of any place in South Bay, what you'll find mostly are these little tiny tubes. And in those little tiny tubes are the smaller forms. These are the small worms, the small crustaceans that make their living in a slightly different way than the bivalves do. But there's thousands and thousands of these. And then living amongst these amphipods and worms are um, these little clams called the gem clam, and the next talk after me is going to go into much more detail about the dynamics of this particular community, which is important for the shorebirds. And then there's also members of this community that everybody eats if they can find them. And that includes every bivalve has to go through a small, small stage when they settle, and they're available to the, the shorebirds but once they get to be a couple centimeters long, they're less available to the shorebirds. And so we get some sort of stratification with depth on who eats who. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, there's this whole group that live in, uh, these are bamboo worms that we see in large, large sections of South Bay that uh, once they are mature, I don't believe there's anybody that can eat them because they live about a meter down in the sediment in these very solid, hard mud tubes. So uh, we're going to talk about the bivalves, as I said, because that's what we've, we've done the work on at present. And I'm going to start by telling you what we knew when we went into this study, which is that we knew that looking at the bivalves in the system, they're heavily, heavily influenced by the predators. And this is a, 
a plot of bivalve biomass from 1991 through 1995. It's actually showing grazing rate. It's just a function of biomass. And what you see is that every year it goes to essentially zero in January. It starts dropping off in, in October. This was a mystery to me until John Takakawa explained to me how many clams a bird can really eat, which was very sobering to me. I had no idea. Um, so it, it did solve a little ecological problem for me, which was where are the, bird, the clams going every year. And we also know there's another source of um, predation, which is the birds, and particularly the bat rays in South Bay. And you can see on the mudflats, we see where they've been feeding their feeding hole. And in those feeding holes, we see um, shells from the clams that they're eating. So this is something we knew before we started this study. We also knew at a decadal scale, we see major shifts in the bivalves in South Bay as a result of predators. In this case, these are predators that are um, are shifting their their presence in South Bay as a result of upwelling offshore. When we have really good upwelling conditions, we get a higher percentage of these bottom feeding um, fish and crustaceans that beginning in 1999 when the upwelling year began, this upper plot note is in uh, log scale. So we got two orders of magnitude shift in biomass in the bivalves in South Bay in one year. And that two orders of sh uh, magnitude shift was due to an increase in, in these predators. That was, that was what we published in 2007. And then in 2005, when that data was analyzed, uh, we were a little surprised that the bivalves didn't come back here. They haven't come back in 2006 or 7, 8, or 9 in any great numbers, which I'll now show you, not in the numbers that we saw prior to that. And it's one of the things that we're, we're looking at right now. Is that potentially a restoration effect, or are we just not understanding some of the predation effects, all of which are possible? This is a plot of the um, biomass of the bivalves in the system in the channel beginning in 91 through 2009. And this is pre and post restoration here. So unfortunately, restoration kind of happened in the middle of this, this low period when the upwelling kicked in. However, in 2005, we see this period when we would have expected to see the bivalves return. And we see a couple of those years. We did see them return in the channel, but we didn't in the shoals. And that's an interesting pattern for us as we try to figure out what's going on with the bivalves. It's a big question. If they disappear entirely, there's, um, uh, I think, some pretty important questions for those who look at ducks in particular in South Bay have to ask. We're trying to figure this out, so we're also looking at that data spatially. Did we see a difference between pre- and post-restoration and how the bivalves were distributed in the system? This is, again, biomass. We tend to, we like biomass because it's the, one of the things that we can look at um, that allows us to go between trophic groups. We're looking at carbon as the common unit here. And this is standard. This is what we saw throughout the 90s. There are very few bivalves in the spring, uh, which is what we expect. They've been grazed down in winter. Come summer, they start to grow, and by fall, they peak. We, and then they get grazed down again by the, by the birds. Started out in 2006, as we expected. 2006 summer, we're a little surprised that we didn't get the bivalves up here. And um, then the other thing that happened was that they disappeared early. They disappeared long before fall came. And if, is that a question of do we have different predators or do we have predators moving in sooner? It's one of the questions we, these are, we're obviously at the stage of just trying to figure out what we're seeing right now. One of the things that this study is allowing us to do that we've never had funding to do before is to look at the whole community. And um, this is the data for um, the benthic community in April of 2006 and October of 2006 divided by what they feed on and where they live. From your viewpoint, if you're a bird person, what you don't want to see, now we've, we've removed the bivalves from the system. They're the major pressure on phytoplankton in the system. Now the phytoplankton is no longer being consumed by bivalves. It's now hitting the sediment, we assume, or it's being consumed in the water column. We don't know about the water column. So if that's true, we should see a shift in what's living on the bottom. We should see animals that are processing that phytoplankton, or we're going to get a buildup of carbon in the system, in the sediment, and we're going to end up with those deep-dwelling animals that we don't want as far as bird food, because those are not accessible to the birds. Those are represented by the dark brown, I don't, can you see? Yeah, the dark brown 
up here. And we just had a few places in spring that we saw that, but by fall it was gone. Now the relative size here is the relative abundance. This is consistent with what we'd expect from what we've seen in the past. It, it shows that the bivalves aren't present except in the southern extreme where that small gem clam kicked in. What it does tell us is that who's replaced the bivalves in the system, it appears right now, are the tubed amphipods. These are tiny, tiny um, filter feeding amphipods. They filter the water for phytoplankton and um, animals that feed on the surface uh, at the interface between the sediment and surface, as between sediment and water. One of our questions is, is what the long-term effects of this is and we don't know. As consumers, we know that the bivalves have always been important in this system and we've known that because they disappeared every, every winter and spring, that happened to coincide with the time period that we would get the annual phytoplankton bloom in the system and this is what drives the, pretty much the trophic web in the system. Um, this is a plot that for people who are used to looking at phytoplankton or biomass of phytoplankton should be slightly concerned by. This is when the bivalves disappeared. You see that we have what we call a shifting baseline. It never really goes back to zero now. We also see that we're now getting a fall bloom in addition to the spring bloom. This is a cause of concern because this is a highly, um, well, it, it has a lot of potential for eutrophication. The cause of this is likely a combination of bivalves uh, being absent, but also uh, increased light availability, which goes back to the previous conversations that we had this morning with uh, the data from Greg Schellenberger. And I've now been told to stop, so I'm going to, just like that. <laughs> if you but always end on your funding sources, even if you have to stop. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, now we have our second talk, which is also on benthic invertebrates, uh, temporal and spatial changes at a specific pond, and Isa Wu from USGS is giving us this presentation. Here. <laughs> and to thank Jan for really setting up uh, my talk because I had a lot of slides. I had a lot of slides and I really, oh, thank you. And I, I didn't go into much of the introduction of um, invertebrates and why they are important. So this was a very great segue for me. And also wanted to wish you all a happy Lunar New Year. Gong hei fa choi. Um, so Jen has really set this up really well, but why do we study invertebrates? Um, partially because they make up so much of the diversity of life. Um, here we have a diversity of life wheel, a pie chart. Um, they didn't, the, the words didn't come out so well, but you have your um, monaras, your protists, your fungi, plants, and all of these are in the animal kingdom. And these are your vertebrates, but 98% of animals are invertebrates. Um, Jan had set this up really well of the functional um, aspects of why we study invertebrates. Um, they have specific physical tolerances and foraging guilds, um, which make them really great indicators for water quality or indicators of habitat and habitat change. Um, they can cause bioturbation of the mud flats um, as part of the function of where they live within the flat and what they're doing and how they move in there. Um, and, but they're also important prey resources for fish species and birds. Um, and one of the things I'll be talking about um, are mainly the shorebirds. Um, we, we aren't really studying the fish, so, um, but we do know they're out there. So um, it's one of the important data gaps in our study. Um, but in, right here, we'll address the shorebirds and diving benthivores that are foraging within the tidal flat. And this is of um, critical of importance because San Francisco Bay is a site of hemispheric importance for shorebirds and they're important wintering and staging areas for birds to fuel up before migration. So just to kind of give you an overarching conceptual model, this is kind of what we foresee um, 
might be happening within the, within the tidal flats and um, what some of the physical forcings um, control our secondary consumers, our soft-bodied benthic invertebrates over here. So our, the invertebrate community can be preyed upon by the vertebrate predators, um, such as your bird species, the, the western sandpiper and scoters and scop and fish. Um, and, you know, as well, they're also affected by their, their food resources, such as phytoplankton and um, secondary producers. And they're also influenced by physical forcing, such as contaminants and sediment supply, salinity and freshwater flows. And all of that kind of gets mixed together and makes it a, a complicated system um, that has some top-down effects by your vertebrate predators and also bottom-up effects by their um, the invertebrate food resources. So I'm just going to go through a couple examples of um, some of the conceptual things that we've seen in the literature. Um, this is a paper by Cron um, et al. in 2009, and this was a, um, in the Dutch Wadden Sea where he's actually, uh, there's been an experiment of cockle harvest, which is a bivalve, and they've uh, seen the effects of declining food resources on the mudflat. Um, and this was, there are species of interest where red knots were, who are specialized on these um, benthic invertebrates. And what they did is they looked at benthic mapping, color ringing, bird counts, um, you know, for about 10 years. And they looked at suitable foraging area and the spatial predictability of their food resources and bird survival. So here in 1998, these uh, dark um, squares indicate the, the invertebrate densities before harvest and after harvest in 2005. And you could see that there's much, there's a great reduction in cockle um, densities. And then in this, the other graphs here, you see reduced number of um, birds and reduced survival. And red knots lost about 55% of their foraging area. And the numbers decreased about 42%. So they calculate that survival declines around 82 to 89 percent, and some other of some other birds just um, emigrated from the site. Um, and here is a slide on biofilm foraging, which uh, which is actually just you know stolen from Kuwait. Um, Tomohiro Kuwait is an expert in biofilm foraging on shorebirds from Japan, and he was visiting in December and gave a talk. Um, so one of the bottom-up um, controls is, is that the, the, the availability of biofilm as an additional food resource may play a really important role for energetics of these shorebirds. And here you see a very slow motion high-speed camera or high-resolution camera. And he's deducted that the movement and behavior of the foraging bird, you could see the sediment, flu sediment fluid held between the bills and the fluid moving back and forth as if it's sieving. And also he's looked at the tongue structure that has these spines that are conducive for sieving. He's also done some stable isotope and food web analysis, which I am not going to show here, but it indicates that they do forage on biofilm and it makes um, I believe up to 50% of their um, diet. So here we'll go through an example of um, top-down effects. Um, this is a paper by Jan and all and Lisa. Um, and she found that grazing by bivalves determined the phytoplankton blooms and above a certain threshold the bio the blooms ceased. And they speculated that it was because of the bivalves. And when they're preyed upon birds and fish in the fall and winter, they disappear each year. And that the growth of the phytoplankton depends on shallow water processes. And the changes in the benthic filter feeders and their predators has great potential to change the bloom dynamics. So here we see a figure of um, the bio, um, excuse me, the phytoplankton blooms um, in February. And they're very ephemeral, but you can see that they start in the shallow shoals and they propagate into the deeper bay. So perhaps what we're seeing is a combination of both top-down effects and bottom-up 
Um, and a great way to actually look at the, these environments is a self-based salt pond restoration, um, which has embraced adaptive management. Um, in, it, and then it's the largest tidal wetland restoration on the West Coast, and it comprises of 16,500 acres of commercial salt ponds in South Bay, but also an additional 1,400 acres in North Bay. And one of the key uncertainties is how restoration of a managed pond um, will influence the surrounding shoals. And this is um, Pond SF2, and um, right south of the Dumbarton Bridge. And it was constructed, these I bird islands were constructed for habitat for birds. And um, ideal, it's, it's an ideal study site to look at the hydrology, geomorphology, and food web dynamics. So we've, our methods is we've, we study three transects along this elevation gradient and the positions are one through nine. So you'll see the graph, um, one is the one through the near shore. We have three cores per location for a total of 81 cores and we've just started a subsample. We look at this monthly and we started looking at biofilm as well in October 10. Um, some of the methods as we go through, we collect the cores using a deep water core during high tide. We save it through a half millimeter screen and we stain it with rose bengal dye, preserve it, and we sort to the lowest taxonomic um, category. And we, we pay a particular concern to bivalves. We can speciate those and we put them into size classes. And we um, look at biomass. Um, so I just wanted to throw in a slide here for biofilm and to um, have you, you know, look at the poster that John Takakawa and Monica Iglesia as, and others have put together. Um, but we started to look at monthly observations of biofilm for percent cover. Biofilm is the sticky, gooey substance on the top of a mud flat, and it comprises of the microphytobenthos and primarily of diatoms. And it's seen here in this kind of brownish green uh, cover. And we're working with um, the NASA Develop interns, and they're doing some hyperspectral mapping of that. And um, here we have a picture of the field crew. So we're just going to go over some results and starting with invertebrate density and looking at their temporal and spatial variation. Um, so this is taxa densities um, from October 08 to September 2010. And you see that they're really quite varied. Um, these are average density per meter squared. And the major tax that comprises this are your bivalves in blue. Um, but here, when you actually graph this looking at the location of the mudflat over time, you can actually see a little more petitioning of the patterns here. So we're seeing most of our bivalve density within the shallow shoal area, about approximately 300 meters um, from shore. And that the densities out here in the lower portions are very minimal compared to what we find in the shallow areas. And these densities are very high, um, approaching 60,000 per meter squared. Um, when you look at other taxa such as amphipods and polychaetes, we see different spatial partitioning and also seasonal variation. So here the amphipods are more in the mid to deeper water areas and the polychaetes are kind of found throughout. Um, so when we actually do look at um, biomass, we've created, we looked at the entire, uh, so Ariel Rowan is doing some work with us on carrying capacity and she's looking at specific time periods and um, food classes that a shorebird can eat. But here we have the full data set of biomass and we've interpolated um, the total biomass in um, ArcGIS to give a spatial representation of how the biomass is distributed along this particular flat. Um, and on the right side, we see the north transect here, middle transect, and south transect, and how, what the data is comprised of. So in particular, you know, you see the red or bivalves and the gold color or polychaetes. So most of the biomass comprises of those two categories. And we'll just kind of go through time um, 
from June 2009 to August, October, November, and February. So what we're seeing here um, looks like there is some sort of reduction in total biomass. Um, so I wanted to kind of take a little bit further deep and in look into this and look at habitat availability for foraging birds. And so this is where we integrate um, data from Bruce Jaffe, Rob Kane for the topography and the bathymetry of the site. And with the data from the water levels from um, Dave Shellhammer and Greg Schellenbarger, and we actually, and the foraging depths of the species of concern to create these times that the flat is accessible. And we picked two species, um, the western sandpiper and um, scop. And so dependent on the foraging guild, um, the foraging depths in water and sediment will vary by species because some birds are bigger than others and some have longer bills. Um, so a bird such as your western sandpiper will forage within the top four centimeters, but larger birds um, such as your Godwit avocets um, can forage in deeper waters. And your lesser scop is a diving benthivore, and um, we've used a value of 1.5 meters as our optimum foraging um, depth based on data from um, Jim Levern. So when we integrate this all together over a year's worth of hydrology data, um, we come up with the amount of time the mudflat is accessible. So this is just percent times, and here we have a percent time that the mudflat is available for a western sandpiper, and in the shallow areas, it's about 40% of the time the flat is available. And as you go deeper into the um, deeper water, it, it decreases. But interestingly enough, your Lester scop, um, the habitat that the time the mudflat is available, um, doesn't increase with depth as much because um, if you go further into the um, into the flat, you hit the deep water channel and it's too deep. Now these animals can, especially the lesser scop, can forage in deeper waters, like two to four meters, but the optimal foraging habitat based on energetics was 1.5, so that's the value we used. And here is the relationship between the changes in elevation and inundation period. And the flat does not have a lot of topogra topographic relief. And the change in about 10 centimeters is at about change in 3% inundation overall. So we take this data and hopefully that, try, that explains some of the patterns we're seeing in the bivalves by size class. So here we have the average bivalve ash-free dry weight biomass by location and time. And we see that there is a lot of variation, especially by location. You'll see different patterns. The density I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> um, so most of the bivalves are comprised of these little tiny sub, um, size classes, and, um, but the ash-free dry weights are comprised, they're more in the larger bivalves. Um, this is a graph of the bivalves, and they vary over time and space. Um, and in particular, we're just looking at the zero to six millimeters that a small shorebird can eat. Um, the, the green represents the, trend, the position that's closest to shore, and the pink represents the one that is right 100 meters away. And so here we're seeing these might be predation events. But as Jan was mentioning, the, her bivalve numbers also uh, were really low in January, and, and our data from this particular site is supporting that as well. Um, so we're seeing these predation events and also some peaks around here. So the birds or the fish may be predating to keep the bivalve numbers low, but we're also seeing some growth and reproduction here. Um, and trying to figure that out, um, you know, using Jan's um, data and data from the USGS water quality site, we, we overlay some of the area, some of the time periods that have a chlorophyll A spike off the Dumbarton Bridge and found that some, this might be explained by chlorophyll A spike, but not at all periods. Um, Jen also mentioned that the fall um, phytoplankton spike, and so we see that here as well with some increase in bivalve ash-free dry weights, but not all the time. And also 
This may be explained by a wet winter is wetter than average and um, the construction disturbance um, in June. We weren't able to get to all of our sites. So in conclusion, um, patterns are complex. Um, we are seeing distinct monthly and elevation patterns. Um, are invertebrate prey resources limiting? Um, this, they may exert a bottom-up control in foraging birds. Mm -hmm. And what is the carrying capacity of the site? Um, and I really want to refer you to Ariel Rowan's poster out there in the main um, room. She has a great poster on carrying capacity and the biofilm poster. Um, but this may interact with shorebirds exhibiting top-down control in mudflat communities um, and our acknowledgments and funders. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to Isa. And our final talk is going to be Jim Hobbs, who is here, excellent. Um, talking about fish, yay. Uh, Mantra response fish assemblages to restoration. Thanks, Corey. So I'm here to talk about fish. And we are um, monitoring the South Bay salt ponds. So we've put together a, a fisheries program here at UC Davis to um, conduct monitoring surveys of the restoration sites in the South Bay. And we have two primary objectives. Um, first is to come up with a way to actually monitor um, the variable habitats that we see in the South Bay, both um, open bay habitats all the way into intertidal creeklets. Um, looking at the distribution and abundance of the different, prey or different uh, fish species that are in the South Bay and also to um, using a, a couple different sentinel species, one uh, sentinel species for the uh, slough habitats and another for the intertidal habitats to look at the, the health of the, of the species um, both in terms of population health, looking at mortality and recruitment and um, looking at individual health with a biomarker approach. So um, in general, the study area here, we have um, four major areas that we are monitoring currently. Um, <coughs> in the far north, we have Eden Landing. Um, on the uh, east side, on the west side, we have Bear Island. Um, we are also monitoring SF2 and um, the sloughs within the, the um, Alviso complex. So uh, a little closer look at Bear Island. Um, we are doing uh, benthic otter trawling. Um, from a boat, and we are also doing intertidal um, trappings with clover and minnow traps. I'll show pictures of these in a minute. Um, and we also have sites, we have at least one site that is outside of the system within the main part of the bay. Um, in Alviso Slough and Coyote Creek, we are sampling um, <coughs> at least three replicate uh, otter trawls within each of those major sloughs, and we're also monitoring um, fish abundance within ponds A19 through 21, the um, ponds that have been restored since 2006 and, um, and adjacent sites to compare slough and pond abundance. And then at Eden Landing, we are um, sampling, um, we currently sampled within the pond sites that are un undergoing restoration currently, and we are also sampling um, with otter trawls along Old Alameda Creek and, and, uh, and Eden Landing Creek. Uh, and we're also, again, so these outer bay sites, um, we're monitoring outside of each one of these uh, complexes to look at what the source um, fish populations are to these different habitats. And, with, and using uh, this otter trawling method that is similar to what Fish and Game does, we're hoping we'll be able to link up uh, abundances of different species um, south of the Dumbarton Bridge um, with fish and game monitoring surveys which primarily take place north of Dumbarton Bridge um, to get some idea of what the temporal variability is. And so um, I mentioned that it's quite complicated to actually monitor fish abundance in these dynamic uh, habitats. So again, we have these large open bays that are broad and shallow. Um, and we also have um, narrow, more narrow but broad sloughs that are somewhat shallow. So it's very complicated to get a boat in here and to trawl gear without snagging the bottom or having any number of problems. And then we also have uh, some restoration ponds that are currently undergoing um, major modifications. This is the back of SF2 where it's essentially impossible to get a boat in. It's also very, very muddy, so 
to do anything by, by land is very difficult. So in some places, we're able to put out traps and monitor for fish abundance. Um, and then we also have some flooded islands where we have um, a, you know, these intertidal areas that are becoming revegetated um, that could harbor different species. And then we have these burrow ditches. Right now, we're sitting on a boat in the burrow ditch that kind of goes around the island and that are deep enough at high tide that we can actually otter trawl so that we can make comparisons with uh, nearby sloughs. But then we also have these intertidal creeklets um, that at high tide can become inundated on really high high tides, but there are some species that actually live in these little tidal creeklets that are actually pretty important for the overall um, ecosystem function as being prey species for uh, larger um, predatory species. So we're also doing minnow trapping in these habitats to um, to monitor those. And so um, I'll go over briefly the different uh, types of monitoring that we've actually come up with. Uh, and we've got primarily these, f these five different methods, um, first being the, the otter trawl. So here's a picture of, uh, of a couple of the crew members getting ready to deploy the, the otter trawl. So it's just a, uh, it's a uh, six, meter sa uh, six meter net that has these two boards that basically plane out and force the net to stretch out and they ride along the bottom. So this is actually dragging along the bottom with a heavy chain. And we are basically getting anything that's within a meter off the bottom. And then in the intertidal creeklets, we're uh, using these little minnow traps here baited with um, cat food. Fish like cat food for some reason. <laughs> and it's actually very effective, um, but it's also quite muddy. <laughs> And then um, we've also developed uh, a, new, new, uh, a new way of sampling with what we're calling the crane trawl. So this is a modified beam trawl. Um, it actually has sled um, skids on both sides, so it can actually sit on the mud surface. But it has a fixed opening, um, which is sort of this beam. And we can, we can, draw, we can trawl this in really shallow water and, and not get caught up. The skids allow us to ride up over uh, variable topography, and, and this actually is um, very effective in, in these very shallow areas, particularly these ponds that are being restored. And then lastly, we're doing uh, some hook and line surveys outside of the ponds um, to look at the um, predator use. Uh, the otter trawl and the, and the modified beam trawl are not that effective at catching larger um, predatory fishes, so um, we do get to go fishing. And then also at each of these sites, we're uh, measuring environmental parameters. Um, we're using y a handheld YSI and getting salinity, temperature. Um, we use a secchi depth um, to measure the turbidity, which is an a indication of turbidity, and measuring tidal stage. And we also are measuring uh, dissolved oxygen, which can be very important in these shallow habitats. So this is just a, a matrix of, of what we've done so far. In green, we're showing the um, the points where we have successfully been able to conduct monitoring and uh, collect fish. And this on the left here just shows the, um, the different sites that we are sampling, Pond A6 and A8 in, um, inside Alviso Slough that are currently undergoing restoration. And the ponds A19 through 21 that's on the other side in Coyote Creek as a similar comparison. We're also getting the, the two sloughs that that connect those. And in the Eden Light Landing Complex, we've already gone in and sampled some of those ponds that are undergoing restoration to see what was there prior to the, to the, the breaching of these things. And we were able to do that up through October. And then after that, the, the, levee, the levee roads got too uh, difficult to sample. So we're going to be waiting until um, that project is complete to go back and sample. And we've been sampling the, uh, the two sloughs that are, that are uh, adjacent to those, those ponds. And we're also monitoring uh, Pond SF2, which was rec recently brought up, the experimental restoration pond. Um, we're using the, uh, the crane trawl there to uh, sample the shallow waters um, and with good success. And then at the outer Bear Island site, we're doing um, some sampling there as well. And for the most part, we've been able to get to a lot of these sites. The Eden Landing Complex sloughs uh, provide a particular challenge having to cross the bay sometimes. We have to launch out of Bear Island, and it's very difficult to get across on windy, choppy days. Um, but essentially, we've had pretty good success at getting out there and sampling, and, and, by, and we are sampling bi-monthly. So if anybody wants to go uh, fishing, let us know. Um, so what we have learned so far is that salt ponds are salty. Um, <laughs> so this is a picture looking out uh, across one of the uh, levee roads.
And on the left side, we have the bay that is running at about 30 parts per thousand. And then on the inside, where you have very little tidal flow or tidal influx, you get 70 to 85 parts per thousand, which is pretty much in, in, inhospitable to fishes. Uh, although we did trap these places and did not find any fish, so we confirmed it. <laughs> um, so here's a little bit of summary of the environmental parameters that we've been monitoring so far. Um, on the far left, we have salinity, and in the middle is water temperature. On the right is dissolved oxygen. Um, we have the three major slough complexes that we've been monitoring, Alviso in blue, uh, Bear Island's red, and Eden Creek is in green. And essentially what we've seen is that uh, from July through December that Alviso slough is running um, lower in salinity. So there's a freshwater input coming both from uh, Coyote Creek, which has the San Jose Wastewater Treatment Facility, which we have noticed um, contributes quite a lot of freshwater flow at times in, the, in that area. And we also, um, in, uh, we have a, a freshwater inflow coming in through the Alviso Slough. So it's, it's a much fresher estuary there. And it does have slightly different um, uh, dissolved oxygen. So we're seeing slightly lower DO there. And in October, we did witness um, in both Alviso Slough and in Coyote Creek, um, upstream of the, of the pond areas, we had some pretty low dissolved oxygen, um, around two parts or two milligrams per liter, which is right at that, that level at which uh, fishes can no longer tolerate um, the water quality. Um, and then uh, lastly, just at Eden Landing, we are seeing slightly different temperatures than in Alviso and Bear. Um, that might be partly due to the fact that it's got more um, marine influence. Um, but in general, we've seen uh, in October and December that the temperatures are coming down um, quite a bit seasonally, as we'd predict. Um, so, so far from all our monitoring, we've, uh, we've collected over 3,300 fish from 30 different species. And um, quite uh, happily, I like to report that we have 90% of the total abundance is native. Um, working in the Bay Delta system is a very different story where we have mostly non-natives. So uh, in that system where we're talking about significant restoration, there's real concern about creating habitat that will foster non-native species versus natives. Here we have mostly native species, so the, the pond restoration will hopefully um, continue to benefit native species um, while um, not necessarily uh, increasing the abundance of non-natives. Um, but we also have, um, just a note, that we have uh, uh, several different uh, species types. We have pelagic species that are open water column species that swim around. They're highly seasonal. And then we also have benthic species that are much more tied to the particular habitat that we're sampling. And so we are actually using um, a couple of these species to, as our sentinel species. The staghorn sculpin here, which is our um, slough species. And then we have the long jaw mudsucker, which actually I have here, but the long jaw mudsucker is our intertidal species. And so um, first, first of all, to just summarize the overall uh, trends in the data, here on the left we have the mean catch per trawl um, going from July through December. And what we see is that the three spine stickleback and the northern anchovy um, are making up the, the most of the catch. Northern anchovy was a, a particular um, interesting find that um, we've seen in the last 15, 20 years that the northern anchovy in the bay itself has is, is declined significantly. And so to find the numbers of northern anchovy that we did in the South Bay was, was a, a very good thing. Um, we also have seen uh, an increase in, the, in abundance in other sites in the, in the estuary, but um, they're, they're the most abundant actually in the South Bay right now. Um, and then we see that uh, staghorn sculpin and a few of these other species they are um, relatively abundant, um, shoot. and they're uh, showing a slight de decrease in abundance through time up into the, the winter periods. And that's just, this is typical for estuarine habitats where the temperatures decline in the winter time. You get more fresh water inflow. Uh, the seasonal abundance is usually lowest in winter time. But we've also seen an influx of species that are associated with um, a winter assemblage or estuarine habitats with fresh water flow. And we're starting to pick up Pacific herring, which is a, an economically important species for San Francisco Bay. Um, we also um, collected longfin smelt, which is one of the species that's a real special concern in the, in the northern estuary. Um, this species was recently listed as a, a protected species, and we caught a large number of longfin smelt in, uh, in, in December. 
And then um, looking at the catch per trawl, comparing the different SLU um, systems, we've seen that uh, overall Alviso SLU is, is, has the highest abundance, and that's particularly driven by the three-spine stickleback. And then again, the, the staghorn sculpin is actually making up a large um, abundance of fish there. The staghorn sculpin actually is a species that will migrate into estuarine habitats to spawn, so we're having more freshwater flow in Alviso, and that's queuing the staghorn sculpins into those habitats. But in general, uh, for the other species that are, are, are abundant enough to make any sort of temporal trends, we're seeing um, pretty similar trends amongst the different um, sloughs, which is, is very um, good for our purposes. Um, and then looking at the otter trawl uh, data, comparing the ponds, A19 through 21, and the sloughs that are directly adjacent, we're actually seeing higher abundance of the three-spine stickleback and the northern anchovy within the ponds um, relative to directly adjacent in coyote slough. Um, some of the other species that are less abundant are showing somewhat similar patterns, but the ponds themselves are actually functioning fairly well as, as habitat for the, the species that are in the adjacent area. Now we're looking at here at the, um, the sentinel species in long jaw mudsucker. This is a species of fish that lives in the intertidal. They actually can tolerate um, being exposed to air for long periods of time. Um, in the mouth, they have um, vascularized uh, time. Okay, so basically what we're showing is that the long jaw mudsucker is actually quite abundant in Alviso slough, um, directly adjacent to pond eight six, A6 where, um, where we've had recent breaching. And looking at the mean size of these guys compared to Eden Landing where they're actually in the pond habitats, the, pond, the, temp, the permanent ponded water is actually producing slightly better, um, bigger size and, and better growing fish than the um, Alviso complex, even though Alviso is more abundant. And then lastly, the, um, looking at the predator exploitation of these, of these pond sites, the coyote slough where we had a greater number of prey species it, it in itself was actually producing higher catch rates of large predatory fishes like the leopard shark and, and bat ray. And then um, just lastly to note that um, within these otter trawls, we are catching a large number of common invertebrate species, um, most of which are actually non-native. And so we are currently um, looking into uh, quantifying the abundance of many of the invertebrates, including the clams. Um, so overall, we're seeing a, a large number of fish in the South Bay, which is, is very, very good. Um, but we are seeing a couple species, uh, the longfin smelt and the threadfin shad, which are actually part of the pelagic organism decline in the northern estuary. And so it raises some real questions about how the South Bay is functioning within that dynamic of the pelagic organism decline, because there's been so little information on the distribution of these species south of the Dumbarton Bridge that there might actually be um, an important story that's going on there, with, particularly with the longfin smelt. And lastly, the, the restored ponds so far are showing um, pretty good numbers compared to the adjacent sloughs. Um, so the, the restoration of these, these sites are actually providing habitat for the species that, uh, that are in the South Bay. And so in the future, in the spring, we're going to be doing mark and recapture of long jaw mudsuckers to look at, and staghorn sculpin to look at survival and to look at how they move inside and outside of the ponds, A19 and 21. And we're also going to be um, developing some biomarkers for mercury um, and otoliths. So in my other, my other life, I'm an otolith geochemist at UC Davis, and so I've gotten my, uh, my department to kick in on trying to develop um, looking at otolith microchemistry for mercury as a time record of mercury exposure, which could be used down here. And then there's a couple other the lipid analysis that we're also doing. And then um, lastly, I have a, a graduate student that's getting ready to look at the, the abundance of zooplankton and, and the Asian clam that's, that we found in the South Bay as part of the, the bycatch. So thanks for all the fish. Okay, thanks, Jim. So now I believe we have 20 minutes for discussion. If we can have our speakers come up to the table. questions 
captured on the video, so please, if you can, wait for a microphone to come your way. All right, so we're ready for a question? Hello, I'm, I'm Jane Moss, and I'm a docent on SF2, and I was wondering if you had any information about the species composition and abundance there, even though you've only had one month's worth. Um, so, so far, we primarily just caught the staghorn sculpin, um, and pretty good numbers, and we've actually gotten the largest staghorn sculpin within um, the entire surveys within SF2, so it, it looks like it's going to make some pretty interesting habitat. Next. Thanks. Uh, Lisa Windham, USGS. I had a question about these uh, fall phytoplankton blooms, and do we have a sense of maybe what food web that that carbon is moving into? In the bay proper, which is where I work as opposed to the sloughs, which by the way is a different story. Um, it looks like from a benthic viewpoint, it, it's moving into the little tiny guys that the shorebirds eat. So this is the amphipods and polychaetes tube dwelling mostly. Um, we don't know, we don't have a good feeling for zooplankton in South Bay. And uh, Jim Corn has just started a preliminary zooplankton study in South Bay this year. So that should help us. Maybe the zooplankton are doing it. I also found it interesting, and uh, correct, I'm not a fish person. Anchovy eat so phytoplankton, right? I think it's very interesting that anchovy are in South Bay. Right now, we don't have a, a good grazer on the phytoplankton in South Bay. So maybe the anchovy, you know, one of the theories from Wim Kimmer is they moved from North Bay to South Bay because the clams were taking out the phytoplankton in North Bay. So um, maybe they followed the phytoplankton to South Bay, which is a really interesting by story if that's true. Next question. John? Hi, this question's for ISA. Um, I know it takes a long time to analyze invert data, but I just, I happen to notice that your data stopped in September of 2010, which is, which is when we breached, or when we opened up SF2. I was just wondering if you have any preliminary indications of what's happening since SF2 was opened. Um, that's a good question. It, the data doesn't stop there. That's just um, as far as we've gotten in terms of the identification and enumeration. So once we get that, um, it, we, we should have more data coming very, very soon. Sorry about that. <laughs> Laura. Um, hi, this is for, I guess, Jan. Um, your um, talk showed that there was, if I got it correctly, there a decrease in bivalves in the South Bay since about 1999. Is that correct? But um, uh, somebody I'm sure here is from sh um, PRBO, but the shorebird data and the um, other bird population data is is showing it's steady or, or increasing in some in some species. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding. So how do you reconcile those two? I mean, I mean I'm mean, i asking you to speculate a bit, but... Uh, wait, wait, can we get... Get, get the mic. I'll go for it. Hi, this is uh, Julian Wood. Um, we have seen a decrease in the South Bay with... Uh, in overall shorebird numbers and in some species in particular. And I have a poster on that in that other room that you guys can uh, all look at. But yeah, overall the, the total number of shorebirds appears stable, but there are regional differences and species specific um, changes. So. I, I think the difference, um, and I possibly didn't um, explain it well enough that the, the major biomass as far as um, bivalves in the system are the large, the large bivalves. And um, the shorebirds are able to eat them only when they're babies because many of these get to be a couple centimeters long. And as I under, please bird people correct me, you will I'm sure, that, that, uh, that, that I count on that. I know what I don't know and I know nothing here. But, but the, that when you get to a two centimeter, three centimeter uh, muscalista, the shorebirds are not 
taking that, um, but the but the ducks can. So um, a lot of Ice's numbers are Gemma, which is that little tiny one. Gemma is shifting, and it's shifted greatly. A whole story I didn't talk about shifted immensely since the 1970s and what it's done in the system. But um, Gemma bounces around and. I can't honestly say if I know if that, if that shifted from 1999 to present. This data analysis maybe will tell us that. Um, but it's the larger bivalves that have disappeared, and it's the larger bivalves that have the largest ecosystem effect when you look at phytoplankton and when you look at contaminant transfer. Um, those, that's where the bang for the buck is. If you're subtitled, that's also where the majority of the biomass is um, for bivalves. So sorry if I wasn't clear on that. This question is for Jim. Is, do you have any expected negative effects besides the mercury for the fish? Everything seemed really positive, so I was just trying to be negative. Yeah, well, the <laughs> mercury is definitely a concern for opening up A-Day. Um, I know that other contaminants coming out of the system there may be a, an also a, an issue. So a lot of the biomarkers work that I've done in the past um, well, can give us some hint as to whether that's really an issue. I haven't seen a lot of water quality data as far as other contaminants that might be a problem there, but uh, we'll certainly have our uh, eyes on the prize. Um, one of the goals of this monitoring, as I understand it, is to observe and document any changes due to the restoration. And it seems in order to do that, you need sufficient baseline data, and you also need ideally otherwise stable conditions in the estuary. And so I guess a general question is, is there sufficient baseline data? And with all the other changes in the estuary, with um, turbidity, ocean conditions, the uh, pelagic organism decline, are there stable enough conditions in the estuary to actually identify significant changes due to restoration? <laughs> Uh, that, that is also one of our major concerns. We try to get out there as soon as we could before things were at least breached so that we can compare directly adjacent sloughs to the ponds. Um, but yeah, the, there's quite a lot of things going on simultaneously. So to be able to, to attribute increases in any one species to the ponds themselves or restoration themselves is going to be a real challenge. So with the market capture of the fish species at least, we can get some sense of how much use is being um, done within the ponds and hopefully with recruitment we can get some idea whether the recruitment of new individuals is, is attributed to the ponds themselves or from outside areas. And with the odal geochemistry we're hoping we can get uh, somewhere closer with that. I saw a hand over here. Oh, in the back? Okay, go ahead. How about just simply from, from a standpoint of salinity? Is there any um, before and after information that describes the changes just based on salinity and how those might affect fish species? Um, yeah, the, you know, the breaching these ponds with high salinity, I think the, it's, it's really a, a dilution issue. You know, the, the volume of water in these ponds is when it's ponded is not as nearly as great as a tidal influx. So we have huge tidal swings. So over a very short period of time, I'd, I'd expect the salinities to come down very quickly. Um, and then once, once they are breached, the tidal exchange will be, um, be considerable. So um, we do have the influx of fresh water that will change salinities, but the you know, breaching the ponds themselves, I don't imagine it's going to change um, the pattern in salinity much. What I'm, what I'm referring to is that we, that's what we expected was a, by opening up the ponds, it would change the tidal prism, bring saltier water deep into the South Bay. Just simply, is that, is, are we seeing that? Um, I can't say with the data that I have now. I know there's some long-term monitoring stations that might have better data. I mean, we've only started in July. But, you know, the, the volume of water that these ponds would take up, I mean, any one pond might not make much of a difference. Maybe reaching all of them simultaneously could have enough impact. But with climate change, you know, and increase in sea levels, it'd probably be hard to tease, you know, that out. But 
hypothetically you might see an increase in salinity. I, I think I know what your question is, and it's, it's more um, detailed physics than that. And um, I think the, the person we can ask here is Dave Schulhammer. Dave, is, do, do we have any? You can keep your head down as long as you want. I can find you. Do, do we have any hint that, that we're seeing increased salinity intrusion with the tidal prism? Uh, the very simple answer is I don't know. Um, we have not looked at the data in that context yet. Also, you have to realize there's already tremendous seasonal variability in salinity, even in the South Bay, and teasing out a long-term change uh, would be difficult and would probably take many years of monitoring data to get a statistical significance if there is, in fact, a change. Just wanted to hear it from the source. <laughs> Kathy Boyer, Rumberg Tiburon Center. Um, just to complicate things a little bit further, um, you know, the Coastal Conservancy has a new project to try to incorporate subtidal habitats along some of these areas, particularly <coughs> along Eden Landing. And um, I saw you had bay pipefish in your in your trawls, and I'm, I'm curious how your data might serve uh, as baseline for fish and invertebrates um, for upcoming projects that might influence some of these species. There's eelgrass now along Mount Eden uh, Creek, so uh, we're offshore of there. So I'm curious if that's where you picked up the bay pipefish. Yeah, I believe the pipefish we actually caught in Alviso Slough, yeah. which was kind of surprising because we hadn't seen any eelgrass anywhere near there. However, we were picking up some detrital eelgrass, so maybe some of the physics are bringing some of that that eelgrass into that area. But yeah, so the and the long of the short of it, you know, having this monitoring data now you know, is, is going to be beneficial uh, in the future as hopefully seagra seagrass will come back in, in that region. Okay, we're going to take one more question. Laura? The question is for the entire panel, really, but maybe more Jim and Jan. Um, you know, we, we do have issues with water quality in the ponds during certain times of the year. And um, I think there's also some data to suggest that, you know, the the pond water quality is only as good as the water coming in. Um, and in both of your talks, it seems to me there's a, a larger regional issue perhaps going on with low DO and phytoplankton bo blooms. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, so I mean, we have really the largest city of in Northern California and San Jose, and, and there's an awful lot of stuff coming into those creeks, and there's not actually a lot of flow. So the contaminant concentrations are probably pretty high coming off of, you know, all the urban and, and industrial um, stuff that's going on in San Jose. And yeah, you're right. Whatever's coming up from upstream coming into those ponds could be a serious issue. Um, like we saw in October with really low DO shortly after the first rain event. And, and there was some reported uh, dead floating fish and we did find some dead floating fish, you know, just upstream of pond A19 and 21. So you know, having these low DO events might might be a concern, but we know in a lot of places, you know, with the first flush, first rains, we do see a mobilization of a lot of contaminants, and, and it, so it's not a, an event that's, you know, unique to the South Bay, but it could be a concern for, you know, spending as much money as we are on restoration when we have upstream issues. I, th I think from um, the contaminant issues, very complicated, and, it, and I think it's also very complicated by, by what's in the sediment. Uh, uh, having worked at a site for almost 40 years off of Palo Alto, off of the wastewater treatment plant there, which we, we do have invertebrate data for that time period, at the same time we're sampling metal data, I can tell you it's not a simple story. And there it's about as simple as it's going to get because we knew when the source of the major contaminant turned off. Um, I think there's, there's a whole other level which you may be getting to. We're seeing an increase in the amount of carbon coming into the system from phytoplankton. So we're seeing an increase in, in quantity here, which is a reasonable cause of concern, which I didn't go into, but it does, that plot does make certain people in the system take a deep breath when they look at it. You know, are, we, are we wandering towards eutrophication problems in the system? And on top of that, we have a quality problem. We know from Jim Clarence's work that we have some species of phytoplankton in those ponds are not particularly healthy species. We also know that we're getting um, 
more problem problematic diatoms and flagellates coming in from the coast. And we're seeing those being affected into South Bay, in particular in these, these low flow years. Those are going to be a problem if they get moved into, in particular, into the ponds, and that's an ideal habitat for them. Those are the sorts of things I think that, um, you know, it would be great to have a monitoring program to look at that. It would be great to have a monitoring program to look at a ton of things. And, and, and I have a lot of sympathy for you guys trying to decide what are the critical components here? Quali water quality is a critical component, but what are the, the issues that you're trying to balance here in the water quality domain? I, I don't think anybody has the answer for you. I think there are people that can, um, you know, that can talk to you about things like quality of phytoplankton. I think that's something that should be on the table and should be being discussed personally, just because I know what huge effects that can have on an ecosystem like this. Um, the quantity is also, you know, we're, we're looking at the only way we're probably going to answer that is through some modeling um, because that quantity is a bounce of probably turbidity and lack of grazing, you know, so is that the reason why we have these increases in phytoplankton? Looks that way, but is there another component we're missing? And so the only way we think we can get to that is through, through modeling, and, but that's down the road a little bit. Probably not the answer you wanted, so. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for the excellent questions and discussion. Thank you especially to our panelists for really great presentations. You all have done, do great work and work in a, in a not easy environment. I don't know, some of those ponds pre-restoration are <laughs> not so pretty. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Lunch is on your own. We are going to reconvene promptly at 1 o'clock. Uh, the caterer is providing lunches for purchase. There's salad, pasta, and chicken for $9 and tri-tip sandwiches for $6. So we invite you to stick around and visit with folks and look at the posters. Thank you. There's also a um, cafeteria across the way. Head toward the flagpole and keep going. Oh.